Welcome to richplanet.net. We are gathered here today. We are gathered here today. We are gathered here today. We are gathered here today to uncover the truth behind the alien and UFO mystery. I'm Richard D. Hall, and this week's program is about religion and what its doctrine teaches us about extraterrestrials and UFOs. If God exists, then it does not communicate its message through Earth religions any more than it communicates its message through Parmesan cheese. I make no apologies for saying that religion is a set of rules and beliefs concocted by the few to take control of the many. Throughout my life, whenever anyone is born, married or dies, I am obliged to go into a church and listen to the patronising doctrine of brainwashed priests. Why not pay me the compliment and listen to the Rich Planet view, which is based on facts, not on dogma? One thing we can learn, however, from religious texts is their apparent reference on many occasions to extraterrestrials and UFOs. After searching the Bible for possible references to UFOs, I found it to be littered with clues which support the ET and UFO hypothesis. Before I go into actual quotations from the Bible, I need to point out that the Bible and other such texts cannot necessarily be taken literally and therefore this evidence is not as strong as having a piece of a flying saucer, perhaps, which incidentally does exist. Look up Bob White if you have the time. But nonetheless, it is interesting to examine some of these words and debate just what on earth it is they are talking about in the Bible. The Bible itself was written by 44 different authors in 66 books over a period from 1440 BC to 95 AD. There is strong evidence to suggest, however, that many of the central themes and stories were actually derived from much older religious doctrine, such as pagan and ancient Egyptian religions. Today's earth religions have been borrowed from much older religions, and their central themes are clear copies from much older texts. It's quite possible that the stories which were passed down from the older religions were originally based on real facts and described things that actually happened many years before the Bible was written. After reading hundreds of extracts from the Bible, it becomes clear that there are not just one or two references to glowing things in the sky, but hundreds of them. Let's start by examining biblical sentences that could be referring to flying vehicles which of course we know were supposedly not around in biblical times. The Bible uses the word cloud to describe things which are obviously not clouds. On occasions, it speaks of clouds which remain fixed in the sky for long periods. For example, And Moses went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount, and the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. I don't know about you, but I can't ever remember a cloud remaining put for six days. We need to bear in mind here that the only word they had for an object in the sky was cloud. We know that clouds do not remain fixed in the sky for long periods. So therefore the authors may well have been using the word cloud as a euphemism for something else. An object in the sky or perhaps even a craft. There are many instances in the Bible of beings coming down from the sky inside a cloud. The Bible also speaks of clouds flying about the sky at great speed, which doesn't seem very cloud-like to me. The word is being used as a euphemism for something else. The burden of Egypt, behold, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud and shall come into Egypt. In the next text, the Bible speaks about a cloud which remained stationary and provided shade during the day and light at night. So it was all way, the cloud covered it by day and appearance of fire by night. These clouds can also project sound. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, 
This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. The following verse is known as the Transfiguration, where Jesus tells his apostles that some of them will see the realm of God before they die. Two men appear with Jesus, and they are then beamed up into a cloud. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And suddenly, when they had looked around about, they saw no man any more, save Jesus only with themselves. Next, the Bible speaks about scared people entering a cloud. While he thus spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. There are many more instances of people entering clouds, which is quite ridiculous. It is perfectly plausible that in these cases they were referring to some type of craft. And then shall thy see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Just as the word cloud could have been used to describe a flying vehicle, the word fire is probably not being used literally. It's the only word they had to describe an intense light. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof as the colour of amber, out of the midst of the fire. We know from UFO sightings of recent times that bright balls of white and amber light are often reported. Another word used to describe vehicles is pillar which is a solid object like a column or a base of some description. Sometimes the term pillar of cloud is used. And it came to pass, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. Chariots, or sometimes a chariot of fire, are sometimes described as coming down from the sky. The word horses in this next verse, translated from the Hebrew word kuuk, means rapid movement or flight, not literally horses. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. There are many references to fire coming down from the sky. Are we to take this literally and believe that actual fire came down from the sky? I personally don't think so. Fire coming down from the sky could quite possibly be describing a brightly glowing vehicle. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace and the whole mount quaked greatly. Behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. In this next example, a being is described inside the vehicle. I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. Next, Paul describes the light he saw as being brighter than the sun. At midday, O king, I saw the way, a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me, and them which journeyed with me. The following verses use the word vessel, which actually means apparatus. And saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners, and let down to earth. The next verse I've picked out is rather peculiar. I'd be interested to know from viewers what on earth the Bible is talking about here. Then I turned and lifted up mine eyes, and looked, and behold, a flying roll. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits, and the breadth thereof 10 cubits. So a flying roll, whatever that might be, 20 cubits, which is 35 feet long, and 10 cubits, which is 18 feet wide. 
35 feet is slightly longer than the average house, and 18 feet is the length of a large living room. This is very bizarre, or as I sometimes like to say, it's Bob Lazar. What on earth could the Bible possibly be referring to here? Answers on a postcard to richplanet.net, P.O. Box, Bob Lazar. Next, Jehovah warns Moses about an area referred to as a mount, which could be a UFO landing site, perhaps. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that ye not go up into the mount, or touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death. There shall not be an hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. Our friend Jesus Christ. As Bill Hicks once said, why do Christians use the crucifix as their sign? If Jesus came back from the dead, the last thing on earth he would want to see would be a cross. Throughout history, strange objects have been depicted in pictures and paintings which bear a striking resemblance to the flying saucers in modern day ufology. away from UFOs and onto the ETs themselves. What does the Bible teach us? Most of us have heard of angels and probably have a picture in our mind of what an angel is. The Wikipedia definition states, angels are usually viewed as messengers of a supreme being sent to do the tasks of that being. If the God described in the Bible was in fact an extraterrestrial, as some people believe, then the angels would logically also be extraterrestrial. In the Bible, angels are not described as they are in paintings, like cute, chubby babies with wings, harps and halos. There are no references in the Bible to the appearance we ascribe to angels. In fact, they are described as powerful, brilliant and warlike. Here are a few intriguing quotes from the Bible which might change your view of what an angel is like. Then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote, meaning to attack and strike, in the camp of the Assyrians, as a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. And the Lord sent an angel which cut off all the mighty men of valor and the leaders and captains in the camp of the king of Assyria. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Now they don't sound very angelic to me. 
Everyone is familiar with the concept of angels coming down from the sky, and the Bible is full of examples of angels ascending and descending from what it calls heaven, which incidentally in the Bible just means sky. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment, or clothing, white as snow. And for fear of him the keepers did shake and become as dead men. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping their watch over their flock by night. And to the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. So what can we say about angels? They were not human, they did not look like angels portrayed in paintings, and they regularly travelled to and from the sky in glowing clouds, or crafts. Is it not perfectly plausible that the angels were actually extraterrestrials? And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. The next verse describes seraphims above a temple. Seraphims are the highest rank of angel. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. The Catholic Church decided to remove an important book from its Bible called the Book of Enoch. Enoch describes the angels being in close contact with mankind and that they actually taught mankind previously unknown knowledge. This knowledge would explain why mankind's progress was accelerated at that time, from being a primitive barbarian to being able to build complex monuments. The book goes into detail about a plot by certain angels to breed with mankind. And it came to pass, when the children of men had multiplied, that in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. And the angels, the children of heaven, saw and lusted after them, and said to one another, Come, let us choose us wives among the children of men. The Bible speaks of giants being born on the earth. They apparently had appetites that matched their size. These giant hybrids ate all man could produce, and when man could not produce enough, they began to eat humans and eventually each other. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of man, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And they became pregnant, and they bare great giants, whose height was three thousand ells, who consumed all the acquisitions of men. And when men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. And they began to sin against birds and beasts and reptiles and fish, and to devour one another's flesh and drink the blood. The next verse describes an actual giant king. For only Og king of Basham remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabbath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man. The measurement of King Og's bed is 14 feet long and 6 feet wide. King Og's height is estimated to be 12 feet or higher. If one is to accept these biblical facts, then the giants, or Nephilim, were very human-like beings of great stature. The Guinness Book of Records lists the tallest man in medical history as Robert Wadlow, who was 8 feet 11 inches. If we compare him to a 12-foot biblical giant, it makes him look like a shorty. This ancient Sumerian tablet seems to illustrate the same kind of proportions. There is also supporting physical evidence that giants did exist in these times. In the late 1950s, a 47-inch human femur was found in Turkey. This would make the being between 14 and 16 feet tall. It is rumoured that buried below the Vatican are the skeletal remains of giants which once walked the earth. The evidence is hidden by the Catholic Church because it is a truth they do not want into the public domain. The Bible goes on to describe that God flooded the earth in order to destroy the giants. 
The Great Flood is spoken about in many other religious texts and probably was a real event. The Bible is also littered with references to advanced technology. For example, the description of how God made woman from one of Adam's ribs. Could this be describing the process of genetic engineering being carried out by extraterrestrials when mankind was created? And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is a now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So do you, do you look after the church? Well, I'm a, I'm a steward. Right. Do you believe in God then? Yes, it's really God. Of course. Okay, I'll come down because there's not in the arse. So where's where St Andrew now? St Andrew? Mm -hmm. he, well, he's one of the disciples. Okay. And his bones were here? Some of his bones. Okay. Oh, yeah. And, and where are they now? Oh. When the dissolution came and all the monasteries and churches were knocked down, they probably did what they did with the chalice, which is upstairs. They hid it in a coffin and it was discovered a long time later. They probably did the same with the bones, but nobody's ever found them. This corridor here. Just a couple of bottles of red wine. Something became abundantly clear when researching information for this programme. The Bible is not interpreted correctly. It seems that it has been interpreted to suit the agendas of those in positions of power, which is to control the people. There is no conclusive proof that any of these stories are indeed referring to aliens in spaceships from another world. Having said that, these are stories from thousands of years ago describing things like beings stepping inside glowing clouds which take off and ascend into the sky. There are three possible explanations for these stories. A. They are fictional stories made up by humans. B. They loosely record actual events which took place thousands of years ago. Or C. They are miracles carried out by God. I personally completely rule out C. Of the remaining possibilities, I lean strongly towards B. If we accept that the Bible is a record of actual events which took place thousands of years ago, the only plausible explanation I can see for some of the bizarre stories is that extraterrestrials were playing an active role on the Earth during these times. Over the coming months I will be speaking at various venues throughout the UK, including St Anne's and Newcastle-upon-Tyne. For details on future events, please log on to richplanet.net. You can also find details of my book, Aliens Before Gentlemen, and a selection of richplanet.net DVDs.